You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. Welcome to Smart Sex, Smart Love. We're talking about sex goes beyond the taboos and talking about love goes beyond the honeymoon. I'm Dr. Joe Court. Thanks for tuning in. Today on Smart Sex, Smart Love, we're going to be talking about men and body image. On today's show, I'll be just discussing how men are increasingly concerned about their body ideals, and yet society generally minimizes these concerns or doesn't acknowledge them. We have a society of men who feel unable to speak up about these concerns and often sit with it, which causes them to have emotional distress, which can result in depression, body dysmorphic disorder, and health issues related to excessive exercise and rigid food consumption. My guest is Chris Wilson, doctor of human sexuality, licensed marriage and family therapist, and certified sex therapist from Pennsylvania. His work with men often focuses on expectations of their bodies, including physical ideals, erectile functioning, and concerns of how others perceive them. In working with the LGBTQ community, he often helps process couples' issues, coming out concerns, body image concerns, dating, and social relationships. Chris believes we need to start acknowledging these body issues men have and address them in larger social construct. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. Oh, so glad to have you. And we only have 30 minutes and so much to discuss, so let's just jump right in, okay? Okay, sounds great. Well, what would you, can you explain body dysmorphic disorder first? Because people hear that and they're like, what? I don't know what that means. Yeah, the basic idea behind body dysmorphic disorder is that people become fixated on body aesthetic aspects. And it can be anything from fixation on like a specific body part, such as like their nose or their ears being too large. But oftentimes what we see with men in particular is a body dysmorphia that actually focuses on muscle. And it's really called, it kind of known as muscle dysphoria because it's about the idea of having too little muscle mass or not being big enough, not, which equates to not being masculine enough or manly enough. And so these men have this idea that in order to achieve the sense of masculinity, manliness, they need to have these large physical bodies. And that takes time and energy. And the way they do that is oftentimes through an excessive eating regimen or through excessive exercise or a combination of the two. Um, in more extreme cases, it can actually lead them to use steroids, which have a host of health problems and potentially can lead to death. Really awful. How do you uh, work with that in, a th- in the therapy room with them to help them with that? Part of it is really kind of helping them to try to look and help them break down what a typical normative physique would look like versus a physique that is built on this predication of overly masculine, overly muscular. Also, going back to a little bit more history about how they developed this challenge, when did they start feeling the sense of having to need to be this ultra masculine expectation or depiction of what it means to be a man? And Typically speaking, in the clients I work with, they will voice having really early messages of, of a young person, you know, under the age of five, getting these little messages about being what it means to be a guy. You need to be strong. You need to be masculine. You need to be muscular. You, you need to be the strong little man. Um, you know, you need to be the big support for your brother. You need to be this. You need to be that. It's a level at which we start grooming young boys to be men at a very early age. And we do something similar to women, but in a very different way. Yes. And when you when you say ma- male body ideals, did you already describe that or is that something different? So maybe I didn't describe it, so I'll go back. So male body ideals are specifically around this idea that we are supposed to be muscular, large beings, that men are supposed to be able to physically take up space. They're strong. Um, aspects of it that are not necessarily physical, but kind of a part of the encompassment in terms of a persona are things such as being stoic, being unemotional. And these are all pieces of what it means to be a man and what has historically been part of the idea of what's called hegemonic masculinity. The idea that men are supposed to be uh, non-feeling, almost, almost robotic-like workers, uh, providers, uh, people who 
are there to support the family, but through financial means. These ideas are all encompassing and they all connect back to the body ideals that men feel that they have to have. Yeah, and I feel like um, this is c- happening um, more and more. Uh, I feel like it wasn't like this 30, 40 years ago when I was younger. I feel like un- unless I wasn't seeing it, is this newer to you or has this always been the case and we, and we just haven't talked about it? Oh, I definitely would say that we're looking from a timeline standpoint. We see an ebb and flow around what it means to be a man. It changes from decade to decade. And if we just look at, um, you know, let's say circa the 1950s forward, uh, you know, the 50s and 60s man, for the most part, the 50 man in particular was the working man. He was out in business. He was either a day laborer type or he was in the business world. And his sense of identity comes from being able to put on a power suit, go to the office, go to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, And that kind of identity carries a big sense of who he is. And while a certain level of aesthetic was there, meaning that you you don't want to be a big old beer belly, but you weren't expected to be super muscular masculine either. It was really kind of focused around, you had a slim figure and you were kind of fit, but you weren't like uber muscular. We don't see the uber muscular hyperactive pieces come into play until around the 1980s. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple of main things that happen then. From a cultural standpoint, we start seeing women have more buying power. This starts really kind of in the 70s with the women's movement. And what happens then is advertisers start saying, oh, well, how do we attract female buyers? Oh, well, how do we attract male buyers? We've showed them beautiful women. Oh, okay, so let's show beautiful men. Oh, women like that. Women start buying our products. And oftentimes, all of these things were actually... Um, advertised first for gay audiences. So gay audience were actually oftentimes test um, test subjects and they would say, oh, gay men, you like this. Okay, mm-hmm. now we're going to extrapolate that and say, hey, women, do you like this too? Oh, you like this as well? Great. This is a marketing tool now that we can use. And with that, we start seeing a projection of much more hyper-masculine physique images. We see it through Rambo. We see it through uh, um the Terminator, who's now back, oddly enough. Um, we see it through these, uh, the 1990s Calvin Klein advertisement. Yeah. These are all things that start to show males as being put on a premise of physique beauty, which hadn't historically been marketed to the mass audiences. If we look at gay men specifically, they've had some of these things since the 1930s and 40s with the pictorial magazines of like the farm boys. Yes. Um, you know, but it didn't project as well until really about the 80s and 90s for the general populace. And then since then, we've just seen a consistent uh, hyper-masculine projection. We see it on shows such as Teen Wolf and movies like Superman Mm -hmm. and all these shows that, you know, you can argue the entire uh, CW lineup of men all feature this. And Mm -hmm. the things that the young men that I'm working now with who are in their teens and 20s have been growing up with. I and love. So oh, go ahead. Carried over time. I love that you're reminding us that we teach boys this, and these boys grow into young adults and men. And people, you know, because I see a lot in my office or in our culture, people shaming these guys for being this way and what's wrong with you and why you like this. And we all forget that we teach these little boys how to be this way and to become this way from very early on. And that's so appreciated that you said that. That's what you mean, right? Yes, it is. And I think we actually shame them in two different ways. We shame them in the sense of the hegemonic masculine perspective of you can't cry, you can't be vulnerable, you can't be um, empathetic. Yep. So then they internalize all those things and they hold that in. Same goes with the body image expectations. We project all these beautiful pictures of people that you're supposed to aspire to, but then, oh, you can't talk about that. Females, you all get to talk about that. You can talk about the fact that, you know, you don't look like um, Jessica Alba or uh, um, I think of another female right now, uh, 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 Scarlett Johansson. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot more difficult for men to talk about the fact that they don't look like like Chris Hemsworth or um, Scott Evans or uh, Chris Evans. Um, You know, these people that have these more hyper-masculine physiques. And you see all these advertisements. I mean, if you go on Facebook, you see all these advertisements around trying to get these super ideal bodies, 
whether it's through like the keto diet or the paleo diet or, um, you know, slim fast to be everything um, kind of moves in that direction. And so we've definitely seen a huge uptake in how this imagery, imagery and these pressures have picked up, particularly through starting with the 1980s. One of the things I see in the, in my amongst men in and outside the therapy room is people, men preoccupied with feeling their, um, penis size is too small or not big enough. Oh, yeah. Right. And they, they can't even talk about that openly with each other because then people make fun of and, and then, you know, they have average size penises. They'll, uh, they talk about the length and, and I say this, that's average, you know, but they still have this feeling it's small. And you laughingly, um, under, with a knowing understanding, see this too. Is that correct? Oh, definitely. I actually had a, a gentleman on, on um, my couch a few months ago who I, you know, was saying, you know, what, you know, talking with him and his wife around his own insecurities, around his penis size. And his wife's like, no, you're above average. And I said, and I said, then like, do you know what average is? Yeah. And he was, he was like seven. I'm like, no, that's like well above average. Um, I said, depending on your study, an average can be anywhere from about 5.1 inches to about 5.6 inches in length. And he was like flabbergasted the fact that that would be the number. And so much of that is built around the fact that we have, of course, stereotypes. In his case, he was an African-American man. So there's a lot of stereotypes around African-American men having larger penises. But I also think in general, we have a lot of young boys and men who have literally grown up with porn Mm. at their access point and Mm. their fingertips. And and typically young men I'm working with right now who are, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, they've grown up with this literally on hand. You know, something that you and I were a little bit older, (laughs) something you and I didn't have access to. Right. Um, I was a teenager when the Internet kind of became about. But I can tell you back in the day when I would look for porn at 13, 14, it was literally you would download something. It would take a half an hour and you'd get like a five second clip, you know. Yeah. Nowadays, you search the internet, you can find anything you want in terms of the genre within seconds. And so a lot of these young men are seeing these super masculine bodies. They're seeing these super well-endowed men, and they're comparing themselves to that. And there's still a lot of research to be needed on this group of young men about how porn is shaping their ideals. Um, there's, of course, a huge debate, as you know, in our um, in the field of, you know, is there a porn addiction? Is there a porn problem? for young people. And and I don't believe in porn addiction, but I do definitely think that porn shapes the way in which we look at our bodies, how we feel about ourselves and the expectations we have about sex. Yep. And um, also, uh, I, let's not forget that men only see flaccid penises in the shower. So then they're comparing themselves oh, to yeah. other flaccid. So you can't do that. I always say that you can't. And people are showers and growers, you know, like there's a, a whole host of ways of, of um, knowing this, you know, size of penis and being comfortable with your own. Um, yeah, that's a great point. And the reality is that some people that argue, that, well, you know, if he's a shower and he's showing, you know, at four, then he's got to be at least nine. No, if he's showing at four, he might only be 4.5. Right. Exactly. <laughs> some yes. men don't actually get much harder than what they're showing. Well, Vice versa, you might have someone who's showing at like two and he goes to six. Yes. What would you say are, um, you already kind of said a few, but uh, the main the different experiences women have about their bodies than men do? Yeah, women in general, the research shows that the biggest push is really to be thin. And it's really to focus on that thin ideal physique, having a very small waist, having slightly larger boobs, um, having a, you know, possibly a slightly um, more hourglass figure is a little bit more in vogue with people like the Kardashians putting that out there. Jennifer Love, uh, Jennifer, I must say Jennifer Love, he went, uh, actually no, Jennifer uh, Lopez. Mm-hmm. having these slightly mm-hmm. more uh, curvy physiques. Yep. But even those women, they're not big women. They just happen to have really large breasts and large butts, but they're not big women. And so there's still, even within that, this idea that you're supposed to be small. You know, uh, Khloe Kardashian has gone on famously and talked about how she struggled with her body image quite a bit. But even with her, when she was heavier, she was still a gorgeous woman. And yet the media like picked on her relentlessly. And if you can imagine that women who are in the spotlight are experiencing that, think about the women at home who have bodies that don't even come close to that ideal. 
Yeah. And you know, what I started noticing in the 90s, and then Mike and I, my husband and I, were starting to go on cruises in the 2000s that, you know, I felt like the guy in the gay male community, the guys were getting bigger and bigger. They started to look like the bullies that used to bully me on the playground or bully me in the in middle school and high school. And yeah. it was such a hyper masculinity. Can you speak to that? What's that about for gay men? Is it different? Yeah, there's a huge pendulum swing that keeps happening back and forth regarding kind of femininity and masculinity. So we saw in the 70s more around feminine ideal body. If you look at, say, porn stars that were performing in gay male porn in the 70s, they weren't big guys. Mm -hmm. They were these thin, lean, like they weren't muscular. They were just thin and lean guys. We start to see as the 80s and 90s go about with those things such as the Calvin Klein ads, uh, with gay big, big advertising where, you know, there's subtle hints that there's a gay buyer with muscular physiques, uh, we start to see a push more towards larger bodies. Part of this also comes about through the 80s in a way of connected to the HIV epidemic, whereby people who were trying to not see that be seen as having HIV positive would be focused on their gym bodies to kind of counteract the idea that thinness that was being synonymous with being HIV positive. So in order to curve that, they would go to the gym, seek out to gain as much muscle as possible. And then this starts to kickstart a new paradigm of we must be big, muscular, beautiful guys. Even today, we're seeing um, recently, um, I I read an article that was published somewhere in the last 10 years, where the uh, writer talked about the fact the the line of the article was the twink is dead. And for those who don't know, a twink is typically a young, hairless male, very thin and physique, typically associated with femininity, but not always. And the argument that the author was making was the fact that even now, even though people are trying to be more socially aware, they're trying to be more accepting, there's still this idea that this muscular body need to be shown more often. And we can see it in celebrities, even though um, men like Justin Bieber and Zac Efron aren't necessarily, they're not gay, but both of them have very slender physiques naturally. They have crammed on as much muscle as possible to fit Hollywood ideals. And gay men oftentimes feel this Mm -hmm, as well. mm -hmm. And of course, because we have people like Zac Efron and Justin Bieber who are straight men who are doing this, we're also seeing this in straight men as well. So oftentimes, for better or worse, gay people kind of set the tone for what straight people eventually end up doing. Yeah. So in many respects, the gay men of the 80s and 90s started focusing heavily on these muscular bodies. And then that starts to swing a projection. Now we see that even if you're a young man, straight or gay, and you're thin, you need to cram on as much as mu- much muscle as possible or you're not going to be considered value. One of the things I've always struggled with as a, a man is I'm super hairy. I always joke that if I stayed in my mother's womb another half hour, I'd be a, a true bear, a true cub. And, you know, we have in our in the gay male community, there are people who is the daddy bears. Like I'd be considered a daddy bear yeah. today. But I hated it. And so I would always like I, – I've, I've done waxing. Like my back is so hairy. I look like I have shoulder pads. I have so much hair on my shoulders. <laughs> and it hurts like fuck to get somebody to have waxing yeah. your back. I mean – and finally I just said I can't do this anymore. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. Um, and so I, I mean I do I, – I shave myself. But the, the point is – uh, in the 70s, being hairy was was okay, and I was, and hairy was in porn. Mm-hmm. But then it went away, and that's what shamed me. And I, and even on the cruises, I wouldn't hang around the regular parts of the boat. I'd go to where the bears hung out, right, because the bears were all mm-hmm. hairy, and I felt, like, more comfortable. Only in the last few years have I accepted the body hair, and I've seen – when I take my shirt off – Gay guys are like, that hairy body is hot as hell. Uh, where, where, yeah. Why do you hide it? So do you feel like that's changed too? Oh, definitely. I would say that when I was a teen, so in the 90s and I was 20 in the 2000s, so I would say through the 90s and into mid to early 2000s, we were waxing everything, <laughs> get as, rid of as much hair as possible. And then there slowly becomes this kind of change as we go into that that first decade of 2000 and into our current decade, we start seeing a little bit more of like, ooh, hair can be attractive. And I would argue that it started maybe with like the beards, and we start seeing much more bearded people now. Mm-hmm. I'm rocking a beard currently, um, and my <laughs> husband rocks a beard. And the reality is, I think this becomes a much bigger trend. And then, of course, with that, then becomes, ooh, 
there's something sexy about a man with a hairy body. That masculine aspect of hairiness has now become in vogue. Oh. So even if you don't have that super muscular body, but if you're hairy, yeah. you can get some masculine points and uh, beauty points uh, just for being hairy. That's exactly, I never thought about it. That's exactly what it's connected to. And I'll tell you, I've had women uh, say to me, oh, I don't like hairy men and I, I wouldn't be into your body. You're too hairy. And I say to them, I'm just glad I'm gay then because there's so many men that are into <laughs> that my body. You don't have to be into my body. What can men do to have a healthier body image? That's such a loaded question, but I think the <laughs> biggest thing is they can start to talk about it. I think, you know, just being able to converse with others who are feeling that same pressure is a huge relief. I think one of the biggest things that I offer to men in therapy is just a chance to talk to another male. I think that piece of it and just being able to have, for lack of a better term, a cathartic relief of I am holding all this in helps so much. Helping them to understand deeper emotions is another big piece. As you know, someone who works with a lot of men, like men typically hold their emotions at the anger frustration zone and trying to get them to go deeper can be a big challenge. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the guys I was working with the other day started to cry. He was like, can I get up? And started like pacing my office a little bit because he was so fearful of like crying in front of me. And I normalized it but he still got up into this thing. Mm. And the reality is that I think just getting into the spaces is a huge part of it. I also think uh, one article I read when doing my dissertation research talked about the power of truth presentations, whereby if we can show people how these photos, how these images are manipulated, if we can show yeah. how the actors go and get ready for these roles, yes. the bodies aren't getting this, this high degree of perfection. Yes. Then we can start feeling better about our bodies. I can almost guarantee you, if you were to get people like Chris Hemsworth or um, Chris Evans or Chris Pines, any of the Chris's, uh, you know, to talk about how like their bodies are typically on a given day yep. versus how they are, as they go into these roles. They would tell you that their bodies are not the, this big. In fact, I think, I think it was uh, Chris Hemsworth who, talked about the fact that you know his arm gained a couple extra inches every time he plays Thor mm. <laughs> otherwise they go down yeah uh, when uh Hugh Jackman straight well all the guys have been straight so uh decided to work on I think it was the most recent Wolverine movie he talked about the fact that he once again had to get his body bulked up even more than he had for the previous roles and he is a big dude so there's this constant pressure and I think if more of these celebrities could go out and talk about hey, this is all the things that we do to manipulate our body to actively work and get to that place. That is so helpful. And, I, and I'm going to applaud somebody in particular who's a silly boy, um, Rob McElhenney, who does It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, plays Mac on the show. And he recently posted a picture a few, probably a few months back now at this point. And it was him in a really ripped muscular body. But he said, I can't, don't, and, it, and he had this funny caption, and it said something that's effective. I don't see why everyone can't, you know, get a body like this. I mean, it's totally reasonable to have 12 hours of sleep, have someone constantly monitoring your food, uh, not eating anything mm -hmm. with carbs. Like, mm -hmm. He really dictated, like, in a joking way, like, yeah, this physique that he has right now is not realistic for 95% of the world. It's why only the, the arguments that are around somewhere between like 5 and 10% of people have these ideal physiques. It's because it's just not reasonable. I can tell you as someone who was once a personal trainer many years ago, I am in nowhere the shape that I was, you know, whatever that, like 12, 14 years ago, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, nowhere near that shape. But that's because I was working out with my clients at the time while working out between sessions. And that was part of my bot, like my job. So I had to keep my body as lean as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that lifestyle now. So it's not realistic to expect that kind of same body as, you know, I had 10 plus years ago. I appreciate what you're saying. And I do appreciate when celebrities uh, take pictures or uh, say and admit, hey, this isn't how I look in between. Like Ben Stiller, you know, he's more gray. He's gray. But when you see him in movies, mm -hmm. his hair is dark. When you see Ben Affleck in between films, he's got a little gut on him. And when you see him in another, mm -hmm. the next film, he doesn't. And it's true. And pe it, that's one very good way to learn that um, and, and understand a body about your body image. But I like what you said, finding other 
other safe men to talk to and be able to say, hey, do you feel this way too? Because most men don't do that. Women do that. Women share their uh, their anxieties about each other's bodies, but men don't. Yeah. And I would also say if we're going to talk about their bodies, do it in a healthy, constructive way. And another article I read in my dissertation talked about how gay men oftentimes talk about their bodies, but they do it so often in a negative way. Mm. They start beating up on themselves. And the fact is that that um, keeps this prolification of uh, these body ideals. It's like, oh, I'm fat. And meanwhile, they have like no body fat whatsoever. Um, I actually remember seeing a small clip um, from a TV show, uh, like the A-List New York. And there was a guy on there, um, Austin Amsel or something like that. He went on to do like Celebrity Big Brother. Anyway, he was had a moment where he takes off his shirt and there's a guy who's next to him and he's saying before uh, he takes off his shirt, he's like, oh, he's going to have a great body or at least I thought he was going to have a great body, but he's fat. And then when you see him, he's like not even close to that. Mm-hmm. Like he might have like maybe a little tiny bit of skin that you could have pinched. Like it, it, that kind of thing needs to stop. And we need to start to really say, no, buddy, you look good. Hey, great work that yes. you've been doing on your body. Yes. But recognize days, bad days happen, you know. Do you think, uh, and I don't know if you have the answer to this, uh, women will always say how mean they are to each other um, around different things. Do you think gay men are as mean or meaner? Or Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. I think, I think they share that in common. Um, I think women can be very, very vicious to each other um, behind each other's backs or even like below each other um, or really pick, nitpick on each other partly because they're not feeling good about themselves. And gay men definitely do that as well. They will call each other fat. They'll call each other derogatory terms. And a lot of him is done in a loving way. We, we both know what the concept of shade. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're given something you know, bad to somebody, but in some ways it's about love and affection. And then what happens sometimes is it's intended to be that, and then it ends up actually being hurtful. Um, and so that is a huge factor in all that as well. I love it. What would you say, before, we're going to come to a stop in a little bit, is like your main message to men? I think my main message to men would be feel free to talk about what is going on for you internally, whether that is about body image concerns, whether it's about penis concerns, uh, whether it's about erectile difficulty concerns, whatever that might be. Talk to someone, go to a therapist, feel like you can do this. And it's not just for females Um, that talking to your other friends is really important. Start working to break down this idea of a code of silence that, is among men where we can't talk about what's going on for us because the more we can talk, the better we're all going to feel, the more society will change in a positive direction. And it doesn't have to be all sunshine, lowly pops and rosies, you know, super right. like everywhere ends in a cry circle situation. It can just be like, Hey dude, I'm having a really hard time. Do you mind listening to me for a few minutes? I really like the idea of breaking the male code of silence because that's true. We are taught as little boys that code and then we commit to that code and stay loyal to it throughout our lives. And hopefully this podcast will and your work uh, will help open up men even more. I really appreciate you being here. Where can people find you online? So people can find me on uh, my website at chriswilsonphd.com. They can also find me on Facebook and Instagram at chriswilsonphd. All right. Thank you so much, Chris, for being on the show. I really, I knew it'd be great and it was better than great. And I appreciate you being here. Thanks so much for the opportunity and appreciate being on the show. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Talk to you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smart Sex, Smart Love. I'm Dr. Joe Court, and you can find me on joecourt.com. That's J-O-E-K-O-R-T.com. See you next time.